name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Well, we have come to the second preparatory Sunday as we turn our attention and focus towards the coming season of Great Lent. And on this Sunday, we have heard our Lord's beautiful parable of the prodigal son, the son who begged his father to give him his share in the possessions that would be his when his father died, essentially telling his father, you're dead to me. I want my inheritance now. And going off into a far country, separating himself from the father, he wasted his living that had been given to him on partying and drinking with women and feasting. And how he was reduced to abject poverty, but thankfully came to his senses and returned to his father, begging forgiveness, and was restored once more as his son. And we see in this parable, as the Holy Fathers have placed it here to help us prepare for the season of Great Lent, we see an image of each and every one of our lives in some way, how we come back to God through repentance and confession, how we take what God has given us, his many blessings, our freedom of will, the image of God that rests within us, all the things in this world that he has created, and we don't want them as his, we want them for ourselves, we want them for our pleasures, we want them to feed our passions, and we depart from him, we go far off, away from the Father, not far in distance because God is everywhere present and fills all things, but far from him in our hearts, in our thoughts, in our intentions. And we turn ourselves to sin, and at first it seems like a great time. There's parties and riotous living and feasting, but in time it reveals itself. The curtain is pulled back and we see it for what it is. It is the famine that befell that young man. That famine was there all along. There was just a thin veneer of pleasure wiped over the surface of it to tempt him to give up the great gifts that he had from God and to trade them in for this nothingness of sin. And so he was put to slavery. And so our sins do to us as well. They reduce us to a servile state. But he came to his senses that's the beautiful, beautiful but in the middle of that. But then he came to his senses. He realized where he was. And he thought about it for a moment. I would be better being a servant in my father's house and having a daily share of bread to eat. Maybe some clean hay in the barn to sleep on. Whatever it is is better than living here where I am. And so he determines within himself and he models for us how we ought to return to the Father. He says, I will go back to my Father. I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. I am not worthy to be thy son, but please receive me back as a servant in your household. And this, brothers and sisters, this is what we must do as well when we come to our senses. We must make a firm dedication to come to the church to come to the priest who is there to speak the words and be the presence of Christ to us. And we must be willing to confess boldly what we have done. You'll note, my spiritual father always likes to point this out, you'll note that the young man doesn't go, I'll go back to dad and say, you know, I had my problems, you had your problems, you know, it's a little bit of a share on both sides, you know, a little bit of this psychology, you know, maybe we can work things out. We'll go on Dr. Phil or something like this and, and, and we'll see if we can straighten things out. No, he takes the blame on himself and he goes to him and he tells him right clearly what he has done. And so too we must do when we go to confession. We clearly explain what it is we have done so that we might receive forgiveness. But what is so beautiful? He's probably shaking in his boots as he goes home just like we sometimes are when we come and we have something big that we need to get off our souls in confession. But the father, he's not sitting there going, oh, here comes that scumbag son of mine. He better grovel pretty well for me or I'm not going to have anything to do with him. No, he's watching. And from afar off, he sees 
his son coming and breaking with all the conventions of propriety and and right order, he darts off down the road to grab his son in his arms. And his son begins to give that prepared confession, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before thee. And he goes, shh, 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 shh. He doesn't even let him get it all out. He made the confession, but he he says, you're not going to set the terms of your penance. You're not going to set the terms upon which I restore you. Instead, he embraces his son. He puts a new robe upon him, taking those filthy, stinking, pig-scented, pigsty-scented clothes off of him. He puts a ring on his hand. He puts new shoes on his bare and dirty and filthy feet. And he takes him back to his household. And he rejoices because his son has returned. And so Christ God does to each and every one of us when we come to our senses and return to the church. He is not standing there like a judge with a sword ready to bring it down on our heads. He's like that expectant father who watched every day with a set of binoculars looking for some sign that the son was returning. And when we do return, he warmly embraces us and he restores us because we've come to our senses. And our duty from there on is simply to stay in the household and to not to depart once more. Well, the fathers have put this parable here at the beginning as we prepare for Lent to remind us of this, to give us hope in God's compassion, because perhaps in the last year, something has come up that has kept you from going to confession, has kept you from approaching and preparing yourself to reproach the holy mysteries. And you're thinking, how can God ever forgive me? At at best, I can be a servant in his household. I can stand here in the presence of the church, but I can't dare go forward. But he is waiting. He is waiting with open arms to receive you. If you will only make a bold confession of what it is you have done, you will hear those same glorious words of repentance and forgiveness, absolution of sins. So the fathers place this here to prepare us for the great season of the fast. And by coincidence or providence, I would go with the second. We have again this year during the Triodian period, the commemoration of the holy new martyrs and confessors of Russia. Today, as we see on the icon before us, we glorify the memory of all of those countless men and women, monks, bishops, priests, nuns, and just simple men and women boys and girls who gave their lives for the sake of Christ. When the Bolshevik Revolution took place, that incarnation of the spirit of Antichrist, the philosophy of madness, like hell opening up on earth, and began to wreak havoc against the church. And we don't simply lament it as a great tragedy, we see it as a victorious crown that was placed upon the Church of Russia. We read in the Synaxarian last night that when Orthodoxy came to Russia, they embraced it, they were baptized wholeheartedly, they produced so many saints, great hierarchs, monks and nuns, righteous men and women, but they had come into the church too late to take part in the great period of martyrdom that existed in those first few centuries of the church. That time when the seed of the mar- or the, the blood of the martyrs proved to be the seed of Christianity, the, the seed and foundation stone of the church. And so God granted to the Church of Russia, both as a, as a means of atoning for some errors and sins that had taken place over the past few centuries, but also as a crown of victory upon her, so that she might stand forth as a spotless bride. This uh, trial of martyrdom and persecution. Now we know that the events that unfolded were the unfolding of a demonic uh, mentality, the undergirding philosophy that was expressed by Lenin in his essay on socialism and religion. There he saw religion as the ultimate enemy of the human race. He said religion is the opium of people, a kind of spiritual moonshine which enslaves those who are enslaved by capital, drowning their human image and drunkening them so that they do not pursue and demand a life more worthy of their estate. 
And so when he and his comrades came into power, some of their first and most drastic measures were to curtail and to separate the church from any relationships to the state in Russia, and then slowly to chip away at its place in society. They wanted to see religion completely as a private matter. With time, as they came into more power and authority, they stripped all churches and monasteries of their property. They deprived church weddings of any force and status in the country. They banned all forms of religious education. And as the persecution gained steam, they would strip legal rights more and more from the church. The church would be constantly subject to harassment. The atheist ideology of the godless, as they called themselves, the League of the Godless, would be purported uh, all throughout the country. Many of the clergy who would stand for the sake of the church found themselves imprisoned, and even worse, churches were destroyed, either bombed or, or shot down with cannons, and the Soviets, intending to destroy the unity of the church, did so by trying to orchestrate a certain movement known as the Living Church, or the Renovationist Movement. Trying to attack the church from within by bringing about this group that wanted to do away with all of the church's life-giving and ancient traditions. To do away with, or to introduce married bishops, allowing people, uh, priests to remarry. And doing away with many of the, or revising many of the liturgical practices to make them more in step with the times. And as this revolution carried on its destruction on the church, it saw the bloodshed of numerous martyrs. In the first five years, over 30 bishops would succumb to martyr, martyric death. 1,200 uh, 1, clergy countless nuns and monks, and an unnumbered mass of laity. In total, the victims can only be estimated, but rose somewhere in the area of 12 to 20 million individuals. And we saw as in this hymnography that we chanted today, it was not just the clergy. It was simple men and women as well. As we say in the Troparion, you holy hierarchs, royal passion bearers and pastors, monks and laymen, men, women, and children, you countless new martyrs, confessors, blossoms of the spiritual meadow of Russia. Well, brothers and sisters, in this way, Russia received her crown of martyrdom. I wanted to read to you from a letter of one of the hieromartyrs who suffered in those first few years. The hieromartyr Benjamin of Petrograd St. Benjamin had tried to defend the church, at which at that time in the 1920s, the famine that had taken place throughout the Russian territory had become a pretense for the Soviets to begin calling for people to confiscate all of the properties, with the, or all of the, um, the, the utensils and adornments of the churches to sell them for money to uh, purchase food with. And we know that this famine was in many ways orchestrated and simply used to shake the people so that they would turn against the church. And the church, in many cases, said they were more than willing, St. Benjamin among them, they were more than willing to see for the provision of the people so long as these items that were confiscated from the churches didn't simply go into the coffers of the Soviets. And so he was eventually, because of his opposition to their, mo their movement, he was eventually arrested and tried. And he wrote in just a few days before his own execution to many of the priests in his diocese a letter. And in it he said the following. When I was a young man, I would often read the lives of the saints and admired their heroism and their struggle. From the depths of my soul, I regretted that I did not live in such times and was not able to experience what they did. Well, the times have changed now. And new opportunities to struggle for the sake of Christ have appeared. It is difficult, hard to suffer, because, but according to the measure of my sufferings, consolation abounds to me from God. Now it seems I have to go through everything, prison, trial, public mockery, cries for my death, as if, I, as if the people applauded it. 
the ingratitude of men, their betrayal, inconstancy, and many similar things, anxiety and responsibility for the fate of others, even for the church herself. Well, brothers and sisters, this is what unfolded over the last century in the Church of Russia. But Elder Ignatius of Harbin in Manchuria, a Hieroschema monk, once prophesied in the 1930s these following words, What began in Russia will end in America. What began in Russia will end in America. Now you might say to yourself, Father, how could this be? We don't see these sorts of things taking place in our country. There are no calls for the closure of churches. There are no children being taken from home simply because their parents were teaching them the scriptures and the lives of the saints. We don't see such rabid attacks on the church in, in, in these legal settings. But I would say that the way it is unfolding in our nation is more subtle, more concealed. You see, under the philosophy of socialism, there's been noted to be four prevailing principles. And they came out in a very clear and visible way in the Soviet Union. These are the abolition of private property in the hopes of some sort of utopia where everyone will live together in, in communistic society. The abolition of the family, the abolition of religion, and the abolition of culture and tradition. Now clearly, under the Bolsheviks, these things were carried out very visibly. You abolished religion by trying to blow the church up. You abolished the family by taking away the legal status of the husband and the wife. You abolished private property by uh, you know, repossessing the property and redistributing it. But I would say that many of these same things, these currents, are, under, are, are go, unfolding in our own nation. In our country, certainly, we still are allowed to possess private property. But what is the ultimate goal of the abolition of private property? but simply to make people focus on a this-worldly utopia. And we get that as well, because in our society, we get everything we want, when we want it, and how we want it. And in all these ways, we forget about eternity. The effect is the same if the cause is slightly different. How about the abolition of the family? They don't need to carry out legal uh, attacks on the marriage in many ways, we're doing that for them ourselves. Sex has been liberated from the normal context of marriage. It is now completely normal in our society for people to engage in it outside of the marital relations. And marital relations are something that, if you're not happy with where you are, easy divorce, move on to the next spouse. And in so many ways, we're seeing this, this institution of the family assaulted, mocked in our media, mocked in our, in our own um, private conversations. And we spoke a couple weeks ago about the scourge of abortion as a means of de dealing with unwanted children. The abolition of the family is firmly underway. How about the abolition of religion? Once again, there's no need to destroy the church when all you have to do is create the idea that religion is simply a matter of private concern. It has no bearing on the society outside of the four walls of this building. It shouldn't infect our education. It shouldn't infect our decisions in society. It shouldn't even infect our conversations at Starbucks. Religious education and other expressions are removed from the schools. I remember as a high schooler running a Bible study in a prayer group in the, in the school I went to. And I knew the laws because I wanted to make sure I wasn't, you know, overstepping anything. And regularly, regularly having school officials taking down our posters, refusing to make our announcements, removing us from the yearbook, all sorts of things that no other group had to go through. No other group had to go through these things. And regularly I would have to go in lay down the laws for them, show them what we were allowed to do, show them that they were going against, you know, and, and basically threaten, do I need to bring a lawyer in here just so some friends of mine can get together and sit and read the Bible after school? This is where we are, brothers and sisters. Furthermore, when religion becomes just one activity among others, 
You don't need to shoot a cannon at a church when all you have to do is schedule a football game, a Boy Scout or Girl Scouts meeting, a dance or something else, even just a good sale at the mall on a Sunday, people won't show up. How many people do you think across our country today are not in church because they're getting food ready for a special game tonight? You might think about that. Further, the Soviets, in pushing their cause for the renovationist movement of the living church in their day to call for the changes of so many traditions of the church, we don't need them from the outside to do that. We have our so-called orthodox academics in our country that are calling for the abolition of so many aspects of our life-giving tradition in the church so that we can be in step with the times embracing homosexuality, embracing you know, serial monogamy, embracing so many other things. No, brothers and sisters, we can't accept this. And finally, the abolition of culture and tradition. Is there any culture in the world around us? There's a collective mass of habits and maybe musics and things that we listen to, but can we actually call this culture? Does it produce any life? That's what the word culture comes from. It's the same root where we get agriculture. It's something that's supposed to cultivate life. Is there a culture out there? I would dare say no. So brothers and sisters then, as we look to the models of those holy new martyrs and confessors who suffered in Russia, we can see that theirs was a much more clear and explicit persecution. A clear and explicit attack on the faith of Christianity. But we need to wake up and see what is going on around us and respond to it. Doesn't mean that we have to take to the streets and activism or revolution. We just need to see its effects on ourselves and reject them. We need to dedicate ourselves all the more to our attendance in the church, to our attendance to our prayers, to our attendance to our asceticism, to our attendance to the, to the lives of the saints, so that we learn the true culture, not that which is foisted on us by the world around us. That we learn from them what it looks like to be a husband, a wife, a mother, a father, a son, a daughter, a brother and sister. Not from the television and the images that are around us. And if we will do this, then we too will be living as confessors of the faith. The confessors are those who lived in adverse circumstances and suffered, but did not have to shed their blood for the sake of the church, but did so to continually confess in their life and in their words the faith of the church. And so, brothers and sisters, we are called also to be new confessors of the faith, new confessors of the faith in the face of the oppositions that we face. Don't let yourself be lulled to sleep by the temptations of this world. Don't let yourself simply drift down the rivers of apostasy that we see around us. What began in Russia will end in America, but we can stand against that. Amen.